Part One, Chapter Three of Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, translated by Eleanor Mark Saverling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part One, Chapter Three. One morning, old Rouault brought Charles the money for setting his leg, seventy-five francs in forty-sou pieces, and a turkey. He had heard of his loss and consoled him as well as he could. I know what it is," he said, clapping him on the shoulder. "I've been through it. When I lost my dear departed, I went into the fields to be quite alone. I fell at the foot of a tree. I cried. I called on God. I talked nonsense to Him. I wanted to be like the moles that I saw on the branches, their insides swarming with worms, dead and an end of it. And when I thought that there were others at that very moment with their nice little wives holding them in their embrace, I struck great blows on the earth with my stick. I was pretty well mad with not eating. The very idea of going to a cafe disgusted me. You wouldn't believe it. Well, quite softly, one day following another, a spring on a winter and an autumn after a summer, this wore away piece by piece, crumb by crumb. It passed away. It is gone. I should say it has sunk, for something always remains at the bottom, as one would say, a weight here at one's heart. But since it is the lot of all of us, one must not give way together, and because others have died, want to die too. You must pull yourself together, Monsieur Bovary. It will pass away. Come to see us. My daughter thinks of you now and again, you know, and she says you are forgetting her. Spring will soon be here. We'll have some rabbit shooting in the Warrens to amuse you a bit. Charles followed his advice. He went back to the Berteau. He found all as he had left it, that is to say, as it was five months ago. The pear trees were already in blossom, and Farmer Rouault, on his legs again, came and went, making the farm more full of life. Thinking it his duty to heap the greatest attention upon the doctor because of his sad position, he begged him not to take his hat off, spoke to him in an undertone as if he had been ill, and even pretended to be angry because nothing rather lighter had been prepared for him than for the others, such as a little clotted cream or stewed pears. He told stories. Charles found himself laughing, but the remembrance of his wife suddenly coming back to him depressed him. Coffee was brought in. He thought no more about her. He thought less of her as he grew accustomed to living alone. The new delight of independence soon made his loneliness bearable. He could now change his meal times, go in or out without explanation, and when he was very tired, stretch himself at full length on his bed. So he nursed and coddled himself and accepted the consolations that were offered him. On the other hand, the death of his wife had not served him ill in his business, since for a month people had been saying, The poor young man, what a loss! His name had been talked about, his practice had increased, and moreover he could go to the Berteau just as he liked. He had an aimless hope and was vaguely happy. He thought himself better looking as he brushed his whiskers before the looking-glass. One day he got there about three o'clock. Everybody was in the fields. He went into the kitchen, but did not at once catch sight of Emma. The outside shutters were closed. Through the chinks of the wood the sun sent across the flooring long fine rays that were broken at the corners of the furniture and trembled along the ceiling. Some flies on the table were crawling up the glasses that had been used and buzzing as they drowned themselves in the dregs of the cider. The daylight that came in by the chimney made velvet of the soot at the back of the fireplace and touched with blue the cold cinders. Between the window and the hearth, Emma was sewing. She wore no fichu. He could see small drops of perspiration on her bare shoulders. After the fashion of country folks, she asked him to have something to drink. He said no. She insisted, and at last laughingly offered to have a glass of liqueur with him. So she went to fetch a bottle of curacao from the cupboard, reached down two small glasses, filled one to the brim, poured scarcely anything into the other, 
and after having clinked glasses, carried hers to her mouth. As it was almost empty, she bent back to drink, her head thrown back, her lips pouting, her neck on the strain. She laughed at getting none of it, while with the tip of her tongue passing between her small teeth, she licked, drop by drop, the bottom of her glass. She sat down again and took up her work, a white cotton stocking she was darning. She worked with her head bent down. She did not speak, nor did Charles. The air coming in under the door blew a little dust over the flags. He watched it drift along and heard nothing but the throbbing in his head and the faint clucking of a hen that had laid an egg in the yard. Emma from time to time cooled her cheeks with the palms of her hands and cooled these again on the knobs of the huge fire-dogs. She complained of suffering since the beginning of the season from giddiness. She asked if sea-baths would do her any good. She began talking of her convent, Charles of his school. Words came to them. They went up into her bedroom. She showed him her old music books, the little prizes she had won, and the oak-leaf crowns left at the bottom of a cupboard. She spoke to him, too, of her mother, of the country, and even showed him the bed in the garden where, on the first Friday of every month, she gathered flowers to put on her mother's tomb. But the gardener they had never knew anything about it. Servants are so stupid. She would have dearly liked, if only for the winter, to live in town, although the length of the fine days made the country perhaps even more wearisome in the summer. And according to what she was saying, her voice was clear, sharp, or on a sudden all languor, drawn out in modulation that ended almost in murmurs as she spoke to herself, now joyous, opening big naive eyes, then with her eyelids half closed, her look full of boredom, her thoughts wandering. Going home at night, Charles went over her words one by one, trying to recall them, to fill out their sense, that he might piece out the life she had lived before he knew her. But he never saw her in his thoughts other than he had seen her the first time, or as he had just left her. Then he asked himself what would become of her, if she would be married, and to whom. Alas, old Rouault was rich, and she so beautiful. But Emma's face always rose before his eyes, and a monotone like the humming of a top sounded in his ears. If you should marry, after all, if you should marry. At night he could not sleep, his throat was parched, he was athirst. He got up to drink from the water bottle and opened the window. The night was covered with stars, a warm wind blowing in the distance, the dogs were barking. He turned his head towards the Berteau. Thinking that, after all, he should lose nothing, Charles promised himself to ask her in marriage as soon as occasion offered. But each time such occasion did offer, the fear of not finding the right words sealed his lips. Old Rouault would not have been sorry to be rid of his daughter, who was of no use to him in the house. In his heart he excused her, thinking her too clever for farming, a calling under the ban of heaven, since one never saw a millionaire in it. Far from having made a fortune by it, the good man was losing every year. For if he was good in bargaining, in which he enjoyed the dodges of the trade, on the other hand, agriculture properly, so called, and the internal management of the farm, suited him less than most people. He did not willingly take his hand out of his pockets, and did not spare expense in all that concerned himself, liking to eat well, to have good fires, and to sleep well. He liked old cider, underdone legs of mutton, glorious well beaten up. He took his meals in the kitchen alone, opposite the fire, on a little table brought to him already laid as on the stage. When, therefore, he perceived that Charles' cheeks grew red if near his daughter, which meant that he would propose for her one of these days, he chewed the cud of the matter beforehand. He certainly thought him a little meagre, and not quite the son-in-law he would have liked, but he was said to be well brought up, economical, very learned, and no doubt would not make too many difficulties about the dowry. Now, as old Rouault would soon be forced to sell twenty-two acres of his property, as he owed a good deal to the mason, 
to the harness maker, and as the shaft of the cider press wanted renewing, if he asked for her, he said to himself, I'll give her to him. At Michaelmas, Charles went to spend three days at the Berteau. The last had passed like the others in procrastinating from hour to hour. Old Rouault was seeing him off. They were walking along the road full of ruts. They were about to part. This was the time. Charles gave himself as far as to the corner of the hedge, and at last, when past it, Monsieur Rouault, he murmured, I should like to say something to you. They stopped. Charles was silent. Well, tell me your story. Don't I know all about it, said old Rouault, laughing softly. Monsieur Rouault, Monsieur Rouault, stammered Charles. I ask nothing better, the farmer went on. Although no doubt the little one is of my mind, still we must ask her opinion. So you get off. I'll get back home. If it is yes, you needn't return because of all the people about, and besides it would upset her too much. But so that you mayn't be eating your heart, I'll open wide the outer shutter of the window against the wall. You can see it from the back by leaning over the hedge. And he went off. Charles fastened his horse to a tree. He ran into the road and waited. Half an hour passed, then he counted nineteen minutes by his watch. Suddenly a noise was heard against the wall. The shutter had been thrown back. The hook was still swinging. The next day, by nine o'clock, he was at the farm. Emma blushed as he entered, and she gave a little forced laugh to keep herself in countenance. Old Rouault embraced his future son-in-law. The discussion of money matters was put off. Moreover, there was plenty of time before them, as the marriage could not decently take place till Charles was out of mourning, that is to say, about the spring of the next year. The winter passed waiting for this. Mademoiselle Rouault was busy with her trousseau. Part of it was ordered at Rouen, and she made herself chemises and nightcaps after fashion plates that she borrowed. When Charles visited the farmer, the preparations for the wedding were talked over. They wondered in what room they should have dinner. They dreamt of the number of dishes that would be wanted and what should be entrees. Emma would, on the contrary, have preferred to have a midnight wedding with torches, but old Rouault could not understand such an idea. So there was a wedding at which forty-three persons were present, at which they remained sixteen hours at table, began again the next day, and to some extent on the days following. End of part one, chapter three.